My name is Elizabeth Aloni and I'm with Schneps Media. We're thrilled to bring you a new webinar on the Straight Talk series. This webinar is entitled Ensuring Your Employees Return to Work in a Compliant and Effective Manner. And we have experts from Portnoy, Messenger, and Pearl, Mary Simmons and Christine Whitney Ben will be speaking with us, as well as from Silverman Acapora, Dave Mahoney. So we look forward to a very important conversation and I'm going to turn it over again. I'm going to just remind you that you cannot be seen or heard, but you absolutely can ask questions through the chat function and the Q and a function. And we will certainly do our best to answer those questions as if we can, um, and also be able to get you that information uh, after the webinar, if need be. So I will be thrilled to introduce Ms. Mary Simmons and she will, she will take you on this important journey. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everybody. And I hope that everybody on the call is safe and well in these unusual times that we have right now. And we have some important things to go over and not a lot of time to go over it. Um, so we're trying to give you an overview today. So your questions will be very important. Um, so, um, this presentation is to help you get back to work. So New York is starting to open up as is the rest of the country. And we're going to try to give you information so that you can return your employees back to the workplace in a compliant, safe, and effective manner. Um, just one second, everybody. I'm trying to share my screen. And as we all know, we, we have some difficulties um, with, with technology these days. Um, okay, that should be it, right? Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's start with talking about the summary of what we're going to talk about today. So the difficulty for business owners is that you have so many different guidelines to look at. And we do encourage you to go over all of them and then say to yourself, what's appropriate for my organization and my population of employees? So we're going to try and go over federal, state, and lo some local guidelines for returning to work. We're also going to talk about the federal leave law called Family First Coronavirus Response Act. And we're going to talk about planning protocols. So you before you come back to work, you have to plan how you're going to do it. And you also have to plan for different situations. When I'm talking to clients about returning to the workplace or talking to essential businesses that are already open, I may say to them, well, what if this scenario happens? They go, oh, that would never happen at my workplace. But you really can't look at it that way. These are unprecedented times. And you need to be prepared for different scenarios. So the planning process is essential and hopefully this time with us will help you start to prepare for that. We also want to go over some EEOC guidelines for remote and returning employees. So as I said, there's so many things right now for us to concentrate on, but we can't lose sight of the basic guidelines and employment laws that we need to follow from the EEOC and from the New York Division of Human Rights. So reviewing employee classifications will be a part of that because as we make changes to the workplace, maybe we change salaries, maybe we change responsibilities, we may need to change employee classifications and stay in step with the different uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, Act regulations. So let me just start by starting to plan your return to work. So as we said, you've got federal, you've got state, and you've got local guidelines. So the White House guidelines are very similar to New York and certainly guidelines that are make a lot of sense for most employers. So let's go over those. The first thing for the White House guidelines is that they have gating criteria. So they, they want before businesses to open for there to be a downward trajectory in symptoms, cases, and hospital visits. 
they want to make sure that the guidelines that they put forth are for individuals and employers. So I'm just gonna remind everybody that as your employees return to work, you're going to have to communicate very clearly what you're doing to keep the workplace safe. But this is everybody's responsibility. So you also have to tell your employees, these are ways you can keep yourself safe. So in these times of the pandemic, a lot of people feel out of control. Put the control back into your employees' hands and let them know how they can keep themselves safe. And we're gonna talk about some of those guidelines. There's also special guidance for specific industries. So make sure that, again, any guidelines, federal, state, or local, they will differ depending on industries. So make sure you get the specific guidelines for your industry. Now, this gating criteria must be met each time an employer moves to a next phase. So as we start to reopen, there has been talk about maybe a second wave. God willing, that does not happen. But if it does, they may start to reclose certain businesses. So again, even after this gating criteria is met and you move to phase one, you still have to stay informed on what is happening in your area as far as that gating criteria. So phase one has very smart guidelines for all businesses to follow. So encouraged telework. So the government is saying that where possible, if you've had people that have been teleworking, to please continue that teleworking where possible for your organization. So I'll give you a quick example. I have an accounting firm that we support. They are considered an essential business, but because their type of work can be done in you know remotely at their homes most of the individuals are working from home and so they will continue that telework even as new york starts to reopen because they can and because this keeps their employees safe so where possible you want to encourage teleworking you want to return your employees in phases so we have a manufacturer that had closed for a short amount of time then discovered that they fell under the essential businesses. Instead of just reopening everybody on a certain date, they gave employees different dates for when they were gonna be reopening depending on the you know, importance of that particular position. And they still kept some of their office working remotely. So whenever possible, you wanna keep everybody separate, you can return at different times, you can switch people to different shifts. However we can separate our employees for as long as we can separate our employees, we wanna to continue to do so. We also wanna close common areas. So we're discussing in our office when we reopen the reception area, do we put something in front of the reception desk to keep people six feet away from the receptionist? Or as you've seen in maybe some of your grocery stores, put a plastic barrier up to protect the individuals coming in, as well as our employees at the front desk. And of course, we're always enforcing social distancing. So just like you see at your grocery store, where there may be lines or where you may have individuals working together, put something on the ground that shows six feet apart so they, you can encourage your employees to keep continuing that social distancing. And again, these are things that you wanna remind your employees. It's not just the organization. The employees need to keep themselves distanced from each other. You wanna minimize non-essential travel in phase one. You wanna consider accommodations for your vulnerable population. So Chris is going to talk about FICRA after we finish these guidelines. And that will have some information about how possibly some of your vulnerable population may be covered under the federal leave law, FICRA. But if you have a vulnerable population, I have one employer, he's been in business for 75 years. He's got a very loyal staff. He's got, I think 50% of his staff is over 60 years old. He is an 80 year old gentleman 
uh, who said, I feel uncomfortable coming back. And they managed to find telework for him um, because they're an essential business. So where possible, let's try to keep that population, that vulnerable population, be it because of age or any kind of underlying health reasons, let's try to keep them safe. At phase one, it is mandatory that employers give an employee questionnaire and develop a safety plan. That information for New York can be found on the New York um, Back to Work website. Um, and if you need any assistance with that, obviously we can direct you and help you customize that piece of it. Phase two is to continue to encourage telework, continue to close those common areas and enforce the social distancing. I think this is gonna be part of our life for a long time now. Um, Non-essential travel can resume, again, within reason. You have to look at your organization and continue to consider accommodations for your vulnerable population. Now in phase three, the resuming unrestricted staffing. So in phase three, you may start to ask individuals to come back to work that were not, that were working remotely longer than the rest of the individuals, but make sure that in phase three, you're looking at your local and your state guidelines. So don't forget about looking all the way through because your employees get the best of whatever these laws are. So when it comes to employment laws, they're governed by local, state, and federal. Your employees get the best of those laws. So when we talk about reopening New York, it's very similar to those guidelines that we looked at, right? But New York is opening up in regions. And as you know, they're starting to open up upstate. And phase one of the openings will be construction, manufacturing, and wholesale supply chain select retail using curbside pickup. So if you're a shopper like me, you've already gotten the advertisements that some of the retail stores are starting to open up for curbside pickup. Agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting is also um, opening up. And what they didn't mention was golf courses, which I know Dave is happy about. So, Phase two for New York is professional services. So that'll be our offices, even though we're fully operational now, we'll be able to go back into our office, finance and insurance, retail, administrative support, real estate and rental leasing. And then the third phase will be restaurants and food services, hotels and accommodations. And then the fourth one will be arts, entertainment and recreation and then education. I know those of you who are homeschooling your children are very hopeful that in the fall, the schools are gonna be um, fully operational if it's safe, of course. Um, and again, make sure that you're looking at your local um, regulations because they could differ slightly from state and federal. So now we're, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Christine Wittenhaven, and she's going to talk about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which again is the federal leave for the pandemic at this time. Chris? Thank you very much, Mary. Let's start with a few basic facts about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. FICRA went into effect on April 1st, 2020. It's intended to expire on December 31st, 2020. Under, this, under the act, certain employers must provide their employees with paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave. FICRA applies to the public sector and all private sector employers with 499 employees or fewer. There, you can go to the next slide. Also under the act, Healthcare providers and companies under 50 employees may be excluded. Specifically, the Act provides an employee, an employer of an employee who is a healthcare provider or an emergency responder may elect to exclude such employee from the application of these leave provisions. The Act does consistently hold the FMLA's definition of a healthcare provider, thus permitting the employer to exclude only employees in the following position doctors of medicine, podiatrists, 
nurse practitioners, and social workers and physicians assistants. There is a provision, a provision under the act that small businesses with fewer than 50 employees may be exempt from FICRA's emergency leave requirements if the requirement would jeopardize the viability of a business. So now for employees who take expanded family and medical leave, they must uh, satisfy the eligibility requirement of being employed for 30 days prior to leave, taking the leave. Now there is a posting requirement. Mary, can we go to the next slide? FICRA POSTA, you can find this on the FICRA uh, website. You could find this on the PMP website as well. Um, please make sure that the employers uh, post this in a conspicuous place on the premises. And also, if you have remote workers, make sure it gets emailed to them or mailed to their home. Now we will get into the benefits that FICRA provides employees. There's six of them. An employee who is unable to work for reasons due to COVID-19 circumstances, uh, as described in one, two, and three here on your screen, is entitled to paid sick leave for up to two weeks, which is 80 hours, at the employee's regular rate of pay, or if higher, the federal minimum wage or any applicable state local minimum wage up to $511 per day. An employee who is unable to work due to COVID-19 circumstance described in, our next slide please, Mary. Four and six now is entitled to paid sick leave for up to two weeks, 80 hours at two thirds the employee's regular rate of pay or higher, um, if higher, I'm sorry, the federal wage or applicable state uh, local minimum wage would, would apply up to a maximum of $200 per day. Finally, employees may take both paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave as described in number five. The length of this paid leave is not to exceed 12 weeks in total. This period can cover the first 10 days of expanded family and medical leave, which are otherwise unpaid, but an employee may use their accrued time off benefits to receive pay during that window. After the first 10 days have elapsed, the employee will receive, receive two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay for the hours the employee would have been scheduled to work in the subsequent 10 weeks under the expanded Family Medical Leave Act. Now, since, Fed, since FICRA, next slide please, Mary. Since FICRA, which is a federal leave benefit, is not available for employers over 500 employees, employees who work in New York State may seek benefits under the New York Expanded Family Leave. Paid sick leave is provided if employees make more than, than that $500 a day. You can supplement that with New York paid family leave so that they can actually receive full salary. Next slide, please. Keeping employees safe in the workplace. I'm gonna build upon this as Mary had just spoke about um, when we talk about returning to work, we need to consider a few things. Will you bring back employees at, at once or are you going to stagger their work, work schedules? Review whether or not staffing needs have changed. If you have employees teleworking, will a portion of those employees continue to work remotely? If you are bringing back employees previously laid off or furloughed, provide these employees with a written offer letter to return to work to avoid employees refusing to return because in some cases, an employee may decide it is actually more desirable to stay on unemployment because they're receiving more pay than their regular pay. If this becomes the case, an employee does not, an employee does not accept the offer to return. They may risk losing their benefits and therefore the employee probably will quickly conclude that they must return to work. Also, do not discriminate when deciding which staff members return on site. While we look to protect our employees who may be considered vulnerable, those of a certain age or those with immune challenges, engage in a conversation with those employees and give them the option to decide if returning on site is best for them at that current phase. Maybe it will be decided together and with their input that they remain teleworking or remain on furlough until a later date. Also, maybe there's an accommodation that can be extended to those employees who are considered vulnerable. 
it is best practice to seek legal professional counsel to ensure you are not discriminating. We get into our return to work procedures. I encourage you to visit the New York State's website and view reopening guidelines for your industry. Available on the site is the New York Forward Business Reopening Safety Plan template. This template includes plans for the implementation of the mandatory health screening assessments, such as the use of questionnaires or temperature taking before employees actually begin work each day and for essential visitors asking about COVID-19 symptoms in the past 14 days, positive COVID tests in the past 14 days, and or close contact with people that are confirmed to be suspected to have COVID over the past 14 days. Assessment responses must be reviewed every day and documented. Before your employees return to the work site, you must decide what types of daily health screening practices you will be implementing. Will this screening be done before the employee gets to the work site? Will, I'm sorry, who will be the responsible person at your work site for performing these tests? And how will those individuals be trained? Very important to make sure that they're trained properly. If screening on site, how much PPE will be required for those responsible parties to carry out their screening practices? and how will you supply that PPE to them? So carefully think about how employees are also signing in. There is no more finger scans. Whether or not your temperature checking is, is right for your organization. What type of questionnaire is good for you to use? Keep your doors open so that people don't have to touch the doors. If this is a security problem for you, then decide on having one entrance for all employees to go into. And like Mary said before, the social distancing is ever so important. Continue to just remind people of what they need to do. Having those posters on the walls, putting those stickers on the floors um, are a nice gentle reminder for people because we're all, uh, we all like to be around one another. And sometimes we need to be reminded that at this stage and time, we need to practice that social distancing a little better. Our next slide, return to work communication. This is very important and there's a lot of fear right now and there will be more fear as people start returning back and re-enter into their work site. So communication is really very important. Explain to your employees what the rules are going to be, how the workplace is going to look when they return, what's expected of them. Staggering breaks is a very good uh, system to implement so that you don't have people gathering for their lunch breaks together. You want to make sure that people are protected and continue to put in social distancing efforts. Explain to people what the CDC guidelines are and instruct them to keep themselves safe. PMP has created an employee COVID-19 communications package. If anyone's interested, please reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to help you along with that. So as we return into the workspace, we're going to start hearing um, some issues that come up. And these are some of the examples that I hear from our clients right now. People are simply not comfortable to, to come in. So what do you do as an employee? How do you make someone comfortable? How do you get someone back in? It's very important at this time to make sure you listen to your employees um, and provide options. Ask them, what do they think is best for them? What will make them feel comfortable? Maybe it's taking a crew time off. Maybe it's taking unpaid time off. Set a time frame for them to return at a certain date. And if they do not return, termination could be possible. But before terminating anyone, reach out to your uh, trusted advisors, advisors and, and have them guide you through that process. Also, an employee want, may want to remain remote. If this is possible for your business and that person has been working remotely, continue to do that. It's an option for them to do. But when that option is no longer Make sure that you can communicate to them the reasons why and how they can come back into the work site. I want to thank you very much, and I now turn off uh, turn this over to Dave Mahoney and Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. So as we continue to progress through the pandemic and um, hopefully reopen for business um, in the near future. Um, harassment and harassment claims are probably at the very bottom of everybody's priority list right now. But um, it's, it's worth taking a moment to consider 
uh, EEOC guidelines uh, during the pandemic and also to consider what types of discrimination an employer may have to both avoid and deal with if they notice those things in the workplace or if they receive reports of discrimination in the workplace um, during the process of, of returning to work. Uh, keep in mind that the Equal, Op Equal Employment Opportunity Commission governs all of Title VII uh, anti-discrimination, sexual harassment um, type claims and investigations. Uh, Mary, if you can just flip to the next screen, thank you. Um, nothing about COVID, nothing about the pandemic, nothing about what we're going through right now affects the way the EEOC is going to address claims of discrimination or uh, it's expectations for employers to investigate and promptly respond to um, complaints of discrimination in the workplace. One of the most obvious ways that this could um, become an issue for your business uh, relates to discrimination claims that, are, that may be levied by um, people of the Asian race. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been um, reports of discrimination against Asian people um, and, and how this pandemic um, started in Asia and that Asian people in the United States are being targeted um, because of their race. Obviously, this is against the law. And every employer that receives complaints of discrimination against Asian employees has to promptly investigate and has to promptly address those um, complaints in order to remain compliant with the EEOC uh, regulations. But racial discrimination is not the only type of discrimination we need to keep an eye out for. As we move back into the workplace, even accommodations can give rise to discrimination complaints. So when we're deciding who's gonna come back, when they're gonna come back, and under what circumstances we're gonna reopen the workplace, keep in mind we have to do so in a way that does not discriminate against people of um, protected classes. So if we're going to reopen the workplace, we have to make sure that we do so at the same pace and under um, circumstances that um, take into consideration um, age, um, gender, um, any re religious backgrounds, religious faiths, anything uh, that, that's protected typically under the EEOC. For instance, if you're going to reopen your workplace and say, yeah, but we really don't want individuals over, say, 55 to come back to work at the same time because they're at a higher risk for contracting COVID or for having severe symptoms as a result of COVID. That type of sentiment may be expressed with only the best intentions. It may be done in good faith, and it's still is probably illegal because you're identifying a protected class and treating them differently, even if you're trying to do so as um, a good faith um, accommodation. Uh, also keep in mind that when we're requiring people to come back to work, there's gonna be, there's no school for the next month. We know that nobody's going back to school until at least September. We also know that most summer camps are going to be uh, canceled if they haven't been canceled already. People are going to have a great deal of difficulty finding childcare that will allow them to return to work. So we have to make accommodations for those individuals. And it doesn't matter whether they're male or female. So if you receive a request for that type of accommodation, um, regardless of whether it's from a man or a woman, they have to be treated in a manner that, that's consistent. That if, if you would grant that accommodation for one, you have to grant that accommodation for another. 
if you're requiring individuals to, um, to, to go back to work, just think, what would I do under different circumstances, under the same circumstances with, with a member of either the protected class or a member who's not in a protected class? Um, also keep in mind that employees that have been diagnosed or exhibited symptoms of uh, COVID-19 may be subjects of discrimination, whether it's um, as a disability for an actual um, positive test case or whether it's a perceived disability. If people are harassing individuals who are coughing in the workplace, the employer has to step up and say, it's not acceptable and we're not allowing that in the workplace. All the while keeping in mind to, to continue to publish uh, guidance regarding what individuals should be looking for in their own health and to not report to work if they are exhibiting symptoms of COVID. Keep in mind that um, we, we still are not relieved of our obligations for training and posting requirements during um, the pandemic. Uh, keep in mind that we have to continually notify our employees of certain um, tenets of, of both the EEOC and under state discrimination laws, including a, a written and published policy that there's zero tolerance of discrimination and harassment in the workplace, explaining what exactly is prohibited under both federal and state law. Also letting people know what they should do if they either experience harassment or discrimination or witness uh, discrimination or harassment. And finally, an anti-retaliation policy, reminding all of your employees that they will not be, there will be no retaliation, there will be no adverse employment act if uh, they either report discrimination or participate in the company's investigation of reported discrimination. We can go to the next slide. Although it's not technically under uh, the EEOC, I think it's also worthwhile to note that New York's New York has a specific statute that says you cannot take adverse employment actions against any employee for participating in illegal activity when they're off duty. Uh, it protects employees and applicants against discrimination um, based on legal off duty activities. That can mean anything from, um, you know, um, it can, membership in the National Rifle Association, all the way to, uh, volunteering at a soup kitchen on Saturdays. So keep in mind that you, we are going to have employees that are EMTs, uh, volunteer firemen, that uh, are, are volunteering their time at healthcare facilities. Uh, in other types of, they could also be in the National Guard. There's, there's lots of different um, ways that this could, could be, become an issue because you're going to have employees that are nervous being around individuals that are voluntarily subjecting themselves to possible exposure to COVID. Um, you cannot allow discrimination or harassment of those individuals who are first responders or otherwise coming into voluntary contact with people diagnosed with COVID in their, in their off time. Um, it's just another thing to keep in mind. I think that everyone has shown a great appreciation for first responders and healthcare workers, but you are going to have complaints from people in your organization who don't want to be near someone who's voluntarily sub subjected themselves uh, to possible exposure. And when that happens, uh, you have to remind people that uh, that type of discrimination, that type of harassment, that type of concern, um, albeit, uh, maybe based in good faith is not allowed in the workplace. Uh, finally, keep in mind, just as we discussed with, with the EEOC uh, guidelines and with how we're supposed to respond to claims and um, reports of discrimination, continue to train your managers on how and when to recognize or report discrimination. If you've already 
conducted that training, do it again. This is the type of training that, that never, it, it should never wear off. It should always be uh, repeated. It should be, it should become a part of your yearly routine of reminding supervisors of what, what their responsibilities are. And it's not just your human resources professionals. Um, we, we have managers, we have people in supervisory positions, we have executives whose first um, responsibility, um, their, their priorities are not always based in, in human resources. A sales managers worried about the bottom line, getting sales completed. But still, those individuals are people in positions of power and they have to be reminded what to look for and what to do when they see discrimination in the workplace. All right, Mary, did you want me to continue or are you gonna take this, this section? You're on mute. I can take this section, Dave, if you want me to. Sure. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, we don't want to forget about the other um, regulations that we have to follow. So under the Fair Labor Standards Act, as I hope everybody knows, all of your employees should be classified exempt or non-exempt. And for those of us who don't know the difference between the two, on this slide, you can see some basic information about these this is a lot more complex than uh, just this one slide, but for simplicity, exempt employees are not eligible for overtime. Non-exempt employees are uh, eligible for overtime, and in New York, overtime is 40 hours in a week, okay? So I had an employer today call me and say, yeah, I have a remote employee and she says she worked 10 hours on Saturday and 12 hours on Sunday. And that's all she worked all week. Um, is that overtime? Because she worked over eight hours in a day. In New York, it is not. In California, on the other hand, it would be. Uh, most of the time, exempt employees are paid salary. Non-exempt are usually paid hourly. Your exempt employee salary is paid if work is performed in a given week whereas a non-exempt employee is paid for hours that they work. So what we want you to keep in mind here is if you decide to take temperatures or do some kind of screening when your employees come into the workplace, and remember if you're essential and open now, you have to do this right now, your non-exempt employees have to be paid for the time it either takes them to put um, protective gear on or to stand in line and get their temperature taken or to do a, um, a, a questionnaire. So some of my, our clients are doing some pay cuts, right? These are difficult times. And so what I want you to be aware of on the exempt side, if we cut salary, there is minimum salary uh, thresholds for both New York State and in some cases New York is higher than federal. Okay, so just like I think everybody's aware that on the non exempt side, there's minimum wage, right? So as I said, your employees get the best of the laws. The best example really is minimum wage. So federal minimum wage is seven and change, whereas in New York, in New York City, most businesses right now, it's $15 an hour. Just like there's a minimum hourly rate, there's a minimum salary rate. So make sure that when you're doing pay cuts, you are not taking your employees below minimum wage if they're non-exempt or below the minimum salary if they're exempt. Remember also to look at your job descriptions. If you've significantly changed the position or changed the um, responsibilities that that person has, then you need to update your job description. And if that job description changes significantly enough, you may have employees going from an exempt position to a non-exempt position. As this example shows you, you may have had a manager who, met, who had the executive exemption, meaning they manage more than two individuals during their day. And maybe you had to do some layoffs and that individual now is not managing anybody and there's no other responsibilities they have that make them exempt. 
Now that individual is non-exempt. And so you need to adjust their job description. And more importantly, in New York, I hope everybody um, on the call today understands that in New York, all newly hired employees have to have a wage theft form filled out. And when changes to their exemption and or salary that are not reflected in a pay check. And I will tell you that any decrease in pay, I would absolutely fill out a new wage theft form. So again, just like Dave said, we can't forget about the basic things that we have to do, even though our minds are so focused on what we have to do for the pandemic. So just as a review, check daily and weekly with federal, state, and local guidelines. I believe Elizabeth put in the chat that forward.newyork.gov uh, is the site that you can go to for, or Chris put it in the chat for everybody, to go to for the reopening information. Ensure compliance with FICRA, just so everybody knows, FICRA is paid out of the employer's payroll. And then if you're keeping the correct records, then you can get a tax exemption for the money you paid your employees while they're on FICRA. Make a plan for reopening um, and make sure that you have a team and it's communicated to your employees. Make sure you're engaging your employees um, so that when they come back to the workforce, they are ready to go. And even if they're remote right now, make sure you're communicating to them and make sure you're obviously, as I just spoke about, compliant with wage and our laws. So I think that there's a couple of questions, correct, Elizabeth? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mary, Christine, Dave. This was really beneficial and a lot of really great information for people. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions I'd love for, for you to answer for everyone. Um, Mary, one of the questions was, how can an employee handbook assist a company in staying compliant during the pandemic? Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. A lot of the questions that we're getting can be found in your employee handbook. So if you've kept your employee handbook compliant and up to date, and we encourage employers to be looking at that on a quarterly basis. New York just had a new voting leave law last year, and they already changed it this year. So things change so frequently that you have to stay on top of it. And for my employers in New York City, there's a lot going on with the interplay between New York City sick leave laws, possibly your own leave laws, and now you've got FICRA and you've got New York leave laws for the pandemic. So it can be undaunting, but if you have a solid foundation in your employee handbook that's kept up to date, um, which we're happy to help you with, of course, but that's kept up to date and your employees know about it, it is going to really help you during these confusing times. That really drives home the importance of having that employee handbook. And if it isn't updated, to make sure that they reach out to someone like you to be able to, to have it updated so that they can find all those answers. Right. Right. Mary, also, where do nonprofits fall? In are they professional? So that's a really good question, Elizabeth, and I'll give you a, a, a perfect example. So I have two nonprofits. Well, I, I support a lot of nonprofits, but two of my nonprofits um, over in Manhasset. One happens to be a congregation. So they will be in the very last part of the opening. So it depends what the nonprofit does. The other nonprofit that I have actually is believing uh, through our guidance that they fall under the same um, auspice as, the, um, as a golf course. So they are opening. We have another nonprofit in the Bronx that supplies housing to the underserved population. That's an essential business. So they never closed. So it, the, it's not, they didn't separate it nonprofit and profit businesses, you really have to think what is the core business that your organization provides and then back into how you fit into whether it's essential or what phases you're in. Um, it really depends what your nonprofit does, Elizabeth. Okay, so it really, yeah, that's an important point that it depends. There isn't just a blanket answer. And, you know, we had a question like that too. Any, any idea when New York phase two will open 
um, or are we waiting on cases and hospital numbers to decline further? Yeah, they're, they're waiting for those hospital numbers to come in before they make that decision. I know it's been whispered that it's June 13th um, and that, that may be the date, but they don't have a definitive date yet. Okay, great. Christine, um, can employer request doctor note to show that they meet either that they are sick or that they're caring for someone who's sick in order to get sick time off? Yes, you know, supporting documentation always helps the employer and the employee arrive at the conclusion of what benefits they need to access. So if they're able to obtain that, that's, that's fine. But under these circumstances, sometimes it's not so easy to get a doctor's note. So the employer can just work with the employee and, and take a look at those benefits that they qualify for based upon their discussion. Okay, great. So very important to communicate all of that. Um, Dave, what about the employees who feel they're being treated unfair because the employees with children are being given accommodations? <laughs> well, I think that that's. I think that's an age old question, isn't it? <laughs> Even, uh, before it the I think that that um, raises the broader issue of, you know, people looking at what, what accommodations others are getting and saying, why don't I have that? So we're seeing it with um, employees looking at the parents of kids who are no longer in school. We're seeing it for um, employees of essential businesses that wonder why they still have to go to work. We're seeing it for employees who are able to telework and are therefore not eligible to receive some of these paid leaves. Um, at the end of the day, the answer is kind of the same for all of them. Um, the, the laws that were put in place to deal with COVID were not put in place to give those who are, are, can work and we need to work a free vacation. And those laws were only put in place to help bridge the gap for those that are necessarily out of work because either their work, because their work cannot be performed from home and because they are either experiencing COVID symptoms, they're, um, they're treating or, or helping to care for somebody with COVID symptoms, or they're having to take care of a child at home who should be in school right now. So, um, you know, what we have told employers who have uh, people coming to them and complaining, well, I don't think I should have to work because Joe Smith isn't working. Well, Joe Smith isn't working because jo there are circumstances specific to Joe Smith that prevent him from working. And that's why he's able to access certain programs and access certain types of job protected and paid leave. But those individuals who can work, with, whether it's remotely or on site because their, their participation in on site work has not been restricted by by the governor, um, everybody who can work should be working right now. And if you're, if you're spending your time thinking, I shouldn't have to work because someone else isn't working, we're, we're telling employers to, to let those employees know they should get back to work. Um, you know, this, this was similar to what was brought up earlier, where individuals may have been on um, unemployment and actually doing better based on some of the COVID specific programs uh, financially than they do when they actually go to work. Um, that is not an excuse to refuse a return to work. And if individuals do refuse to return to work, um, they should not be able to access those programs. They should not be able to access those benefits. And an employer is free to deal with them as if they have abandoned their job and to move on and hire somebody else to do the job. Thank you, that's important information for people to realize. And certainly I'm sure a problem dealing in, in, in business even before the pandemic. Um, Mary, a question for you. If I only have six employees and one of my employees does not wanna come back to work because she has a child that's being homeschooled, 
She claims she turned down unemployment for unemployment and she wants me to pay her two thirds salary for 10 weeks. I heard you say that employers under 50 employees can be exempt. Is this true? Yes, uh, and thank you, John, for that question. I was just about to type it in for him. Um, yes, you, uh, employers under 50 employees can claim that it's a hardship to follow the FICRA uh, regulations, right? So that would be the two thirds pay for, it's actually 12 weeks, but um, it's actually a total of 12 weeks. Um, so he can claim that that's a hardship and I could see where he uh, certainly would be eligible for it to be a hardship when you only have six employees to have somebody out and pay for her. But John, you should understand that you will get the money back that you pay that individual um, mm -hmm. payroll credit, um, payroll tax credits at the end of the year. So before you um, decide that it's a hardship to do that, I would talk to your accountant and or, you know, any, you know, individuals that, that help you, uh, you know, attorneys like Dave or Chris and I on the HR side to figure out what's best for your organization. But he can claim that it is a, a hardship for him to give FICRA to his employees. Good question. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, I have a question for Dave. Um, a question came in, as a county employee under a union contract through June 2020, we should be covered for no salary changes or benefit changes, is this correct? Is this correct? Okay, so I think that what that question is, is addressing uh, is the, earlier in the discussion, we talked about an employer uh, unilaterally reducing either salaries of exempt employees or reducing the number of hours worked for um, for non-salaried employees. Um, as a county employee working under a collective bargaining agreement, the employer cannot change your salary or change your benefits or take any adverse action against you without bargaining that change with your union. So the, it's, if the question is, can the employer take a unilateral action? The answer is no. Is it still possible that certain um, reductions could be negotiated between the employer, the county in this case, and the union? Yes, it's possible, but you're still protected by your collective bargaining rights and nothing can be done without um, uh, the employer bargaining those changes with the union. Okay, thank you. There's so, so many questions. I think you know, it really highlights how important it is to get in touch with your organizations, to be able to work out some of these very specific details um, that are so confusing for so many. And that's the, the knowledge base that you bring. So you know, we, we thank you so very much. And it is just about at the top of the hour. Um, and so I wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, really thrilled with our panelists. Thank you so much, Dave Mahoney, Mary Simmons, and Christine Whitney Ben. You have been so informative and so generous with your time. Um, we will, many people have been asking, we will be providing the um, PowerPoint via the email that you provided when you signed up for the webinar. And you most certainly can then connect with them to ask some of these really wonderful questions, so some of them that we really didn't even get a chance to, to get to today. Um, but thank you so very much. Thank you to all the participants, attendees. We are thrilled that you are here with us. Um, really. Uh, tackling some of these very important and difficult questions during this pandemic. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. And, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Absolutely, absolutely. Everyone have a wonderful day. Enjoy. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.